I have a very interesting idea, but it's it's a super complex move. It's one of those moves that could end up being a mistake, but I don't think it is. Yeah, this is such an interesting position, honestly. It's so rich. Such a rich position. I could think about this for 30 minutes, honestly. This, this position is so interesting, and we'll, we'll uh, unlock some of the secrets after the game. I'm excited for this. We are white against Evela Vastida. All right, let's go E4, as we usually do. Mm. <laughs> we are once again facing a Karokan. You know what that means. We get to play the fantasy again. And we already have had the fantasy twice in the speedrun. We've done a lot of theoretical work in the fantasy. So by now, if you've watched the speedrun diligently, you should have a good sense of how to play the fantasy. If I remember correctly, both of our previous opponents, they took on e4, and then they both made the same mistake with knight to f6, kind of an alakine Karokan cross. This time we are facing a new move, knight to d7. And I will admit, I've never seen this move. This is not considered a top theoretical move. It's, it's what I would call an inaccuracy. Now, obviously, a move like this cannot be a huge mistake. It's a developing move. But it's a weird developing move. I mean, it's a passive developing move. And black is not in any way challenging our control of the center. Essentially, black is giving us the kind of position that we want. And black is going to get most likely a very solid but incredibly passive setup as a result. Now, we have, I would say, two main choices here with white. We can close the center immediately by playing e4, e5. And then how are such moves often followed up. Well, if you play the French with white, then you might know that e5 is often followed up with f4. And then you bring your knight out to f3, and then you can further solidify your center by playing uh, c3. And that does seem incredibly, like an incredibly good version of, of the French structure. And I'll show you after the game what exactly I mean when I say French structure. Like if you're not a, a knight c3 French player with white, you might become confused when I refer to the French structure, but you'll see what I mean. So I really like e5 here. I think e5 is, the, is the, the way to try to punish black for this move. The other option, of course, is to play knight c3, just a typical developing move. But after knight c3, what I, bothers me a little bit is the prospect of black taking on e4 and then striking at the center with e5, which leads to some very concrete play that I'm not sure is entirely palatable to us especially given the presence of the alternative e5. So I like closing it down. I also don't think we've had too many of these closed positions in the speedrun, and I kind of want to give you a, a broad overview of how to play different types of positions. And of course, as, as we all know, a lot of players, they struggle with positions that involve a closed center. They feel like they don't know what plans to pursue, and when the center is closed, it's very easy to feel as though you're just kind of shuffling your pieces aimlessly back and forth. Hopefully this game will kind of change your mind in that regard. Closed center positions can actually be some of the most interesting that you get in chess because they force you to play on the flanks, but flank play can be some of the most beautiful and tactical uh, that you see in, in any chess positions. So what are our next couple of moves going to be? Well, most likely we are going to solidify both r r rungs of our pawn chain. Right? I'm, tr I'm struggling to figure out a way to refer to like these pawns individually, but we have a pawn chain right on d4 and e5. So both links of the pawn chain, we are going to solidify with the other pawns to make it as robust as possible. Why do we need to make it robust? Because black is likely to attack our pawn chain with uh, his own pawns, right? So for example, in the French, you often see the move c5. In fact, black may play this move right now. That is why we need c3. Black could also attack the pawn chain from the other end with the move f6. You also see that often in the French. And that's why I like playing f4. So c5 is on the board. This is essentially a no-brainer. We play c3. We most certainly do not want our pawn chain to dissolve this early in the game because we don't have any pieces developed. And the only thing standing between us and like death is our pawn chain in the center. So we definitely want to go c3. You might wonder, well, isn't e5 already well defended? It is. There is a second reason that we want to play f4. And that is, of course, to open up the natural developing square for the g1 knight. And the reason we want to develop the knight to f3 
is that it has no other good spots to go. If instead we had developed the knight to e2, that would just be incredibly awkward, and it would also close off the natural development of the bishop. Queen c7 is a bit of an odd move. I don't think it accomplishes that much. Notice that it does not really threaten c takes d4 because we can take back, and the bishop on c1 is, is protected by our queen. So I think we can continue developing along the lines that I have outlined, and we can do it from several different orders. We can play bishop to d3 first if you want to prioritize peace development, or we can immediately play f4 and then bring our knight out to f3. I like both options. I generally lean toward peace development first when possible, especially because we are technically lagging in development. We haven't developed any minor pieces yet. So I do like the possibility of bringing our bishop out first. And we're also opening up the further possibility of playing knight g1 to e2, which I just mentioned is an awkward move. But with the bishop already outside of, the, outside of its initial square, knight e2 becomes a little bit more appealing to me. We're trying to play as flexibly as possible, given that our opponent isn't developing into ambitious a style. We're, we're leaving open many developmental possibilities. And I largely think this is a matter of taste. I like the look of knight g1 to e2. If you want to prioritize rapid development, that's the way to do it. But if you want to play in a maximally ambitious style and get as much space as possible, then we should go for my initial idea and play f4. But f4 is the more textbook approach to these types of positions. So we're going to go for f4. This is the more kind of I want to take it to my opponent type of move. And I think... When a lot of people see this move, what you'll notice is that the bishop on c1 starts complaining. Like, hey, what about me? Now I'm staring at my own pawn. But the bishop has plenty of space to develop to e3 or even to d2. And this is where I quote my phrase about not every piece you know, having to climb Mount Everest at one time. Bishop to e3 is an entirely serviceable way of developing the bishop. In fact, on e3 the bishop does a great job supporting the pawn chain even further, and we definitely want our pawn chain to be incredibly robust. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Let's start with knight f3. Let's get our pieces out first, the ones that we know where to go. Yeah, or distribute the COVID vaccine. Knight to f5, knight e7. So if you know anything about the French, then you know that usually this knight in the French travels to f5, where it puts pressure, of course, on the d4 pawn. So you might be tempted by the idea of g4, but g4 is way too cavalier. We haven't developed enough pieces to justify a move like that. And g4 is very bad because of h5, classic positional move. And funnily enough, the opposite effect is reached. We play g4 to cover the f5 square, but as a result, black gets a huge outpost on f5. Because after g4, h5, we cannot play h3. That's the big problem black takes on g4. And you often see this on the other side of the board where the rook on h1 is going to be hanging. So instead, we have, again, two options. We can castle kingside, or we can preemptively get our bishop to e3. But what I, And what I like about that move is that in response to knight f5, our bishop can very nicely slide back to f2. And I like that because if we instead castle and black plays knight f5, our bishop suddenly can't come out to e3 anymore. Is that the end of the world? Absolutely not. In fact, in that position, g4 becomes a lot more appealing because it comes with tempo. But these minor subtleties, these minor developmental details, often make a huge difference on the course of the game without you even realizing it. So let's go bishop e3. And knight f5, we drop our bishop back to f2. And later, that bishop from f2 is, first of all, serving a very important purpose of overprotecting the d4 pawn. And indeed, that is what happens. But also, much, much later, that bishop has a way toward infiltrating black's position. Bishop h4 and bishop f6 is a maneuver that you see quite often, especially if black fianchetto is their bishop on g7. Okay, now we continue developing. We castle. Yeah, so the move h5, again, is typical for these structures. And I've used that phrase a lot, typical for these structures, because we do have a very typical type of French structure where our opponent is displaying knowledge of the sort of classic ideas and the classic way to arrange the pawns. But h5 isn't all hunky-dory. Black is preventing g4, that is true. But black is creating major weaknesses, as some of you are pointing out, 
along the dark squares. In particular, notice that we have an outpost on g5. Does it mean that we should play knight g5 here? We shouldn't. Knight g5 allows black to trade and fill some of the holes. But later on, knight g5 could be an important transit point when we start attacking the black king. The other thing that we can do later on is take the knight out of the equation and then stick our dark squared bishop on h4. As I indicated earlier, that could allow us to control all of the dark squares on the king side with our queen. So an idea that you see is actually queen d1 to e1, then the trade on f5, and then bishop h4. And after the trade, our queen on h4 will have access to a lot of these juicy outposts on the king side. But we're jumping the gun here because we haven't completed our development. And with a center closed, the one major like rule about positions with a closed center is that you can generally take more time to do stuff than you would with the center open. And that makes intuitive sense, right? That the position doesn't change that quickly when the center is completely closed, especially when it's as well defended as our center is. So knight a3 is a bit of a dead end move after a6. Yeah, you could be tempted by this maneuver knight a3, knight b5, but I don't like it because knight a3, a6, like where is the knight going to go? I think a, a more robust way of developing here is nb to d2 toward the center. And you might say, well, where is the knight going from d2? Again, nowhere, nowhere yet, but it is in the center. And you never know when its services could be required. It's a Frankfurt Airport move. That's exactly right. The other thing to remember about closed center positions is that, broadly speaking, there are two types of plans. There's a type of plan where we attempt to position our pieces in a certain way and then rip the center open, blast it open, and our hope in such a scenario is that we have arranged our pieces in a better way than our opponent has in order to prepare for the opening of the center. Like we prepare our, our pieces in such a way that when the center opens up, we are somehow better equipped to handle the consequences than our opponent is. And one reason that may be the case is if we have a big development advantage or if our pieces are placed a lot more actively. When the center is closed, the difference in piece activity may not be all that felt, right? Because things are closed up and just the fact that a piece is not very well developed might not be imminently felt. But when the center opens, you suddenly start realizing that all of those disparities in piece activity are actually important. And we, in this very position, with the white pieces, have a very interesting idea that is part of this category of plan, where we just blast the entire thing open and we hope that our more active pieces are going to be better equipped in the resulting chaos to, you know, address the new problems of the position. What am I thinking about? What does it even mean here to open up the center? Well, what I'm not talking about is D take C5. That isn't, that isn't really open the center because DC actually just gives black a little bit more space and it allows black to contest the dark squares in the center, particularly the E3 square. Instead, I'm thinking not about B4, B4, black can keep things closed with C4, but instead about the move C4 ourselves, creating the pawn box. And by creating the pawn box, we are guaranteeing that one way or the other, the center is going to open. But we can play C4 immediately. What we can also do is eliminate black's only active piece before playing C4. We can eliminate black's only active piece and then go C4 and really try to pin our hopes in the resulting position on our incredibly active pieces. So bishop takes f5 is what I'm thinking about. But I also really like the look of c4. Because we can delay bishop takes f5. We don't have to play it immediately. We can play it a little later. Yeah, I actually like the look of c4. And if black plays pawn takes d4, then we can take the knight on f5. You might look at this and think two things. First of all, what about knight takes d4? Yeah, knight takes d4 is what I was evaluating just now. And hopefully that'll happen so I can show you my considerations. I'm not positive, by the way, that c4 is the correct move. Not at all. I have a feeling that it is, but this is a largely intuitive determination. I didn't do too much calculation here. The second thought that you might be having is how do I know that we're not afraid of losing b2? Well, first of all, losing b2 is almost never a problem when you're castled to the other side of the board. Right? Unless you lose a bunch of other pawns when black takes b2. And I'm sure you've blundered like that before, right? Where you blunder b2, but then you also lose c3. So you don't just lose one pawn, you lose your whole queen side. Here, our queen side is still very much intact. It's not like black 
has anything to do with our pawn cube by taking on b2. Queen takes b2 creates no threats, allows us to consider to continue pursuing our agenda in the center. And I'm going to have to prove it. Queen takes b2 on the board. Okay, let me think for a second. I have a very interesting idea, but it's it's a super complex move. It's one of those moves that could end up being a mistake, but I don't think it is. Yeah, this is such an interesting position, honestly. It's so rich. Such a rich position. I could think about this for 30 minutes, honestly. This, this position is so interesting, and we'll, we'll uh, unlock some of the secrets after the game. I'm excited for this. Let me share my idea with you all. Mm, honestly, this is probably a mistake. Oh, this, I think I know why it might be a mistake, actually. Wow, incredible. Black has an incredible response to, to the move I was intending, which, by the way, is queen to a4. Trying to get the other rook to b1 in order to trap the queen. But that is far from the only way in which we can address this position. We don't need to try to trap the queen. I think the queen is untrappable here. We don't have enough firepower on the queen side. So I think we should instead continue our focus in the center and continue trying to blast the center open so that we can exploit our increased peace activity. So let's start by making a move that we know is going to be good. We know this move is going to be good. C takes D5, right? We need to open up the center in order to do that. Th that is why we played the move C4. And now we take on D5. Now, if black does not recapture, then we can drive this pawn forward to D6. And that looks horrific for black. Absolutely horrific. So black will probably end up taking back on D5. And we're going to have to speed up a little bit here. We've got six minutes. So I'm going to have to make a couple moves, likely without too much explanation. So what to do after e takes d5 is the big question. Well, most of you should be tempted by the prospect of then taking the knight on f5, ruining black's structure even further, and as I said earlier, eliminating black's only active piece, which right now is the knight on f5. So you should be tempted positionally by the move bishop takes f5. Of course, giving away your control over the light squares is a little bit painful, but it might be a worthy price to pay. And I think it is a worthy price to pay. I think that we should, in fact, take the knight while we still have a chance. And now we should complete the opening of the center. We should complete the opening of the center by playing dc. Okay, so we played cd, then we took the knight, now we played dc, and now we can say that the center is fully open, which means we need to start looking for tactics, right? We need to transition from general positional thinking where we can you know, luxuriously bring our pieces out and play a little bit more slowly. Now the center is wide open. Moreover, black has not yet developed their queen side. So we really need to step on the gas pedal here because only a couple of moves is what stands between black and full consolidation of his extra pawn, which let's not forget we have given away. We've given away a pawn. So there's a couple of moves that I think are pretty good here. The move that I that occurs to me intuitively, perhaps it also occurs to you, intuitively, is bishop f2 to d4. Because what I'm seeing there is that we're actually x-raying the rook. So bishop d4 followed by e6 looks really, really interesting as a discovery against that rook, further trying to blast open the center. But bishop d4 is also good as a standalone move. It just brings the bishop into the center, and that's just a priori a good thing. So I'm a simple player. I identify something I like, and we play it. Also, we're down to six minutes, so we got to play a little bit faster here. So bishop d4, it hits the queen. Also, the queen was starting to annoy me a little bit. It was hindering our ability to bring pieces to good squares, right? That queen on b2, definite stops queen c2, right? It, it, it just sort of hangs over us, so let's get it out of there. So our opponent is thinking about where to put their queen. But our response to most moves is, is going to be e6. Right. There's a lot of ideas, and one of the challenging things about surviving these positions, I think our opponent is playing this f fantastically, by the way, so far, making us work, work to prove it. The thing is, if we do not go e6, then black is going to stick a knight on e6 and somehow keep the center closed. So e6, at this point, is pretty automatic. Oh, and that, I think, was a big mistake. That right there, I think, might be the decisive mistake, because this allows us... And I'm going to play this move without thinking to take on f7 and drive the king out into the open. And once the king is on f7, we definitely have the firepower to exploit that. 
F6 was the only move there to, to survive. This is going to be destruction, I think. All right. So there's two moves here that I like. Most of you are probably tempted by knight to e5 check. That's one of them. Knight e5, king e8, queen takes h5 check. Might seem like mate, but it's not. It's not checkmate yet. The king escapes to d8. And in that resulting position, unfortunately, the move queen to f7, which would have forked the rook and the pawn, runs into bishop e6. Still not over. There is another move in this position, which is interesting. Knight to g5 check, which leads to kind of a variation of that line. But knight g5 check allows the additional resource king to g6, trying to use the king itself as a defender. We've talked about that concept in a previous speedrun. I, I still think white is a huge attack there, but there's no reason for us to overcomplicate things. Let's go knight e5. Absolutely no reason for us to do anything outlandishly fancy. Okay, whoa. This looks totally like Harakiri. And again, I don't see a, a need for us here to reinvent the wheel. The one pitfall, I think, is the move rookie one, which perhaps a lot of you are uh, looking at and salivating at its prospects. But remember, rookie one, there's knight c5 to e4. When you occupy an open file, you can't assume that black is just going to move the king. By the way, king d6, everybody should see that knight c4 is a fork against the queen and the king. Anytime the king and the queen are in a forkable spot, you have to think about that. So there's no need for us to do anything of that nature. I think the simplest move is queen takes pawn. Not because we win the pawn back. That's not the reason, but because we're trying to get the queen to f7. That is the reason. It just happens to capture the pawn. We would have played that move even if it had not captured a pawn. Okay. So we still have some work to do. Rook f8 was actually a very good move, which makes our job harder. Now... Queen g6 check has to be calculated first and foremost. Bishop f6. And then let me think for a second. Can we find a crusher in that position? It's not as easy as it appears. Yeah, I do like knight g6. That's my second candidate move. I love the look of knight g6 because it opens up the e-file and it targets an important cog in black's defensive machine. That bishop on e7 is handling a lot of the dark squares, which otherwise would be ours for the taking. So queen h6 check is tempting, but there's rook to f6. That's an issue. And maybe in that position, we could drive the queen, I don't know, up to g7, and then queen g8 is a checkmate threat. That does look winning. That looks like an excellent way to play, by the way. Ooh, I love it. Queen h6 check, because the idea is to prevent bishop f6. Incredible. I love it. Let's do it. Queen h6 check. Comparing checks, one of the themes of this move. Not assuming that two similar looking checks do the same thing. Bishop f6 here, of course, gives up the rook on f8. The king has nowhere to go. And what is the purpose of driving the rook out to f6? Well, there are two of them. The first is that the rook is under the x-ray of the bishop. And don't forget that even when you're attacking the king, you are very much allowed to win material. I, I tell this a lot to students. There's a fixation when people are attacking on trying to checkmate the king. And you might think, well, that's the only way that the attack is going to succeed. But there's a whole category of ideas that, in that involve basically using the weakness of your opponent's king in order to win a decisive amount of material. When you're attacking, you can just go for your opponent's pieces sometimes. And because your opponent is so preoccupied with defending their king, he has to put pieces on vulnerable squares. That's why these combinations happen. Queen b4. That's a good move. That's the only move, I think, to keep things relatively protected. Okay, let me think for a second. Queen g8 check, king d6. I'm sure we have some sort of a, a beautiful win. Okay, knight f3 I like a lot. Yeah, I like the look of knight f3. We do have three minutes, so we have to be a little bit speedy here. I love the look of knight f3 because it doesn't give away any advantages. It doesn't give away any advantages. In fact, it prepares knight g5, and it protects the bishop in a very safe way. So the other thing to remember when you've got these types of positions, and of course, like a, a very resilient defender is going to make you work for every little bit of the attack. But m among most levels, your opponent's going to collapse in a matter of a couple of moves. What you have to remember is that 
we haven't actually sacrificed anything. Black just resigns. It's plus 11 in this position. We haven't actually sacrificed anything. And what I wanted to show was that if Black plays a move like Knight to e4, in order to take the sting out of Knight g5, the top computer move is actually an incredibly quiet move that just brings a piece into the attack. That's all this move does. It also cuts off the king from its potential escape route, just the move rook a to c1. These are the types of moves that a lot of people are not willing to make when they're attacking, and yet they make all of the difference between a win and a loss in many cases. Successful attack, failed attack. For instance, bishop d7, we just go rook to c7, and the added presence of the rook overwhelms black's defensive abilities. Here, the top engine move is actually knight f7 with queen to e5 checkmate. Pretty little con concept there. Everything's protected, and this is completely one-sided. So I've already presented a little bit of fantasy theory in previous videos. Um, here, we're just going to focus on our opponent's move because I've never seen it before, and I really want to make sure that we responded appropriately, and I think we did. So e5 is the first big decision of the game, e5. Once again, the reason I rejected knight c3 was because d, e, f, e, and e5 kind of transposes into a more conventional position, and I wanted to punish black for playing knight d7. According to the engine, after d, e, white is a little bit better here, but it, how lame would it have been to go into an endgame this quickly in the fantasy? You can play like bishop e3 and then long castle. And yeah, white is pretty comfortable here, but black has a nice knight on e5. So I'm far from convinced at this, at this idea. So I think we played correctly. I think e5 is the way to punish knight to d7. Now, I kept repeating the term French structure. What I mean is a structure that primarily occurs in two different variations of the French defense. One is the advanced French. This is the classic e5, c5, and c3, and you get the pawn chain from the game, except you get a much improved version for black. This is a better version than what black had in the game because the knight goes out to c6. It doesn't go out to d7, which is a terrible square. It's a dead-end square. The knight has to go out to c6 here. And black puts immediate pressure on the d4 pawn. You can see how different this is from the game continuation. And white isn't able to squeeze, out, squeeze in f4. This is what I meant. There's also a line of the French knight c3 called the Winnower, bishop b4. And a kind of similar structure arises in the main line of the Winnower. e5, c5, a3. And then we often have a trade. This position is incredibly well studied. And again, you have this kind of situation where white is a pawn chain and black is attacking either the base of it or the middle of it with its pawns and pieces. Okay, in the game continuation, it's a much inferior version for black because this knight is placed on a horrible square. And black has lost the tempo playing c6 and c5. So queen c7, I think, is decent. We got our bishop out to d3. E6, f4, I think is pretty sensible. I think our opponent played sensibly for a while. G6, pretty normal move. We got our knight out. They got their knight out. We brought our bishop out. The knight went to f5. And you want to avoid taking on f5 prematurely. I don't like the idea of giving up the light squared bishop until it's sort of absolutely necessary. You can play the move bishop takes f5 at any moment. So rushing a move like that is just completely senseless. And the bishop on d3 is quite a nicely placed piece. So does c4 not benefit black? I think c4 might even be the best way for black to handle this position. I actually think that with the light squares closed down, this move makes a lot more sense. Because a position like this is quite bad for black. First of all, because of what I pointed out earlier, the fact that a lot of the dark squares on the king side are quite weak and we can bring our bishop to h4. But the second reason is that white actually holds a lot of the cards on the queen side. A lot of people are afraid of this type of attack, but it's not very dangerous when you don't have your pieces to support the pawn storm. So like black can bring the pawn to b4, big deal. What is black actually threatening? Not really. Nothing really. Because c3 is nicely protected and we can already start trying to checkmate black on the other side of the board with queen h5, a devastating threat. And you can see how good this knight is. h6, by the way, there's knight e6, a worthy pattern to know. This is mate. So no matter what black does on the queen side, 
our play on the king side is going to be superior. So that's just one example of why c4 is not very effective. You can, of course, also drop the bishop back. And again, after b5, you castle. And if black plays b4, this could actually benefit white. I would even consider taking on b4 and bringing the knight out because the pawn on d4 is so well protected by the minor pieces in the queen that we can afford to give up its support in service of a better developing square for the knight. Later on, you could also play b3 and work on opening the queen side. So Hess always says that the side that controls the pawn breaks usually has the advantage. And in this case, even though it may appear that black has a nice pawn chain, black has no pawn breaks. White is the one who can push pawns on both sides of the board and essentially open up the position whenever he pleases to do that. That's a lot of words, but hopefully that explanation made sense. So c4 might have been the way for black to play. Of course, black definitely in the game regretted not playing c4 because we ended up being the ones to play c4. So we got our pieces out. And I think queen b6 is really the beginning of the end. I think after we played c4, black's position completely evaporates. So probably in retrospect, black should have in fact played c4. And again, we can take on f f5. And a very good move here is actually to play a4 and prevent black from playing b5 altogether. Then we can play our old idea, bishop h4, and carve out the dark squares on the king side. Black has just no active prospects here at all. Or immediately bishop h4 also makes a lot of sense. This is the engine recommendation. So this type of position is horrible because this other knight is coming out to g5, a very powerful outpost. And again, although black has more space on the queen side, white is the one who holds the main pawn break, which is the move b3 to open up potentially even the c-file or the a-file. So c4 was maybe the lesser evil. And I want to show you my inspiration for the move c4 because I came across a game quite recently that I thought was pretty sick. It's played in the French Championship. All right. So this is MVL against DeGrave. DeGrave is a former French champion, very strong grandmaster. I've played him multiple times. Let me replay the first moves really, really quickly. So this was a Karo Khan. I'm going to skip the theory. The theory is not that interesting, but you can recognize the structure and the critical position was reached in this position. So black has this very typical French type pressure on D4 and it actually seems like black has more attackers on D4 than white could even hypothetically have defenders, which is true. But watch what MBL does. He plays this seemingly unconcerned move knight D2. Now, like, what, what the hell is he doing? He's closing down his bishop. And de Grave just takes on d4. And you might imagine that white has misplayed the opening, right? White's lost the main center pawn. What does MBL come up with in this position? It's a brilliant sequence. Turns out the black's pieces are so undeveloped that if white can find any way to rip open the center, white's just going to have tremendous attacking potential. It's too early for knight takes g6. Because you reach a dead end. You don't have enough pieces in the attack. As tempting as it is to sack on g6, it's premature. You just you don't have firepower. You have one piece at most. c4 is correct. And VL plays c4. And he puts another attacker on the d5 pawn. Black has to give away the c4 square for white's knight. But the brilliant move comes after queen c7. It does still look like black is more or less holding on. But in fact, this is already the beginning of the end. The rook is x-raying the king. So you might be very tempted by knight d6 check. But this, while an interesting pawn sacrifice, doesn't seem to produce anything concrete. But how do we set it up? We set it up with knight to d5. Very nice. Sacking the knight. And if what black takes, the knight d6 is devastating. Because here, it's a discover check and black white wins the queen. And if king e7, then bishop g5. And black's king is driven out and checkmated. Then the queen gets out. There's this very beautiful mate. But these lines are ridiculously one-sided. If f6, then white takes it and drops the bishop back to f4, winning the queen. So MVL could not, or de Grave didn't take it. But that allowed the knight to infiltrate b6. Then the bishop came out. And this game lasts like three more moves. MVL brings all of his pieces out. And de Grave resigned. Uh, in this position without awaiting white's next move, which I think is knight takes d7, then it takes e3, and bishop takes g6, winning all of the pieces on the board. 
So that's how one side of this game was and how powerful these C4 ideas can be. Okay, so now let's go back to the uh, speedrun game. And C4 is, as I refer to it, one type of category of plans in closed positions, which is just to reopen the position. The other category is to keep the center closed and kind of worm your way around the center and play on the flanks. Well, this is kind of category one, and C4 is just incredibly powerful. The engine confirms it, by the way. This is crushing. Queen takes B B2, we play CD. We play bishop f5, and we play dc, just completing our plan. Maybe not the best way to play. In fact, if you run this into an engine, the engine will often give these sort of slow moves, these weirdly slow moves. So here, for instance, the recommendation is a4, which actually crossed my mind. The idea is to play a5 and cut off the queen's escape route. And if cd, then you can play bishop f5, and then cd. And in this position, even knight takes d4 is crushing. Because the queen is suddenly in a lot of trouble. The knight's getting into b5. So it's kind of a move that grabs space. It's almost a waiting move. Because black literally has no good way to resolve the central tension. And in the event of a trade like this, white brings the other knight out to f3. This pawn on a4 could act as a very nice little push for the attack. Yeah, it's like plus 2 at this moment. It's like plus 2. So we decided on a more primitive approach. Just sort of fully opening the center. And I will admit that after bishop d4, queen a3, e6, there was a move that I had missed from a distance, and this was literally the only move for black to play. This is the move f6. This was forced. Black had to keep the center as closed as possible, because after rook g8, there is nothing left to talk about. This is just absolute and total devastation. But if black had played f6, despite the sort of flimsy appearance of black's position, it's not easy for us to actually crash through. In fact, I think that white needs to be quite careful here not to be worse. I like the look of the move knight to h4, attacking f5. And if bishop takes e6, then we can sneak the knight into g6, exploiting some of the weak squares on the king side to chip away at black's defensive construction. And then we can play knight e7. And if we can bring the king out, then we actually have this move queen to f3, incredibly strong move, with the idea of the intermezzo on c5. So this is all very, very hard to defend. But if you flip on the engine, it gives some sort of weird engine move. Queen d3. Bishop drops back. Knight e4. I mean, things do get pretty messy here. Ultimately, you get some sort of a liquidation in an endgame. And white is slightly better. But black holds on with bishop takes e6. So f6, believe it or not, it does appear. And somebody should run the engine here at a higher depth. To find out the truth but f6 might have kept black very much in the game position might be objectively about equal so you could say that the strategy that we started with bishop takes f5 was a small was maybe not a big mistake but a small mistake apparently here we also could have played a move like rook to b1 sacking a second pawn and now queen c1 another typical engine idea and now rook a1 traps the queen so the idea, again, is to play against black's queen, force it back. But now we can play dc. That's the other reason we put the queen on c1, to protect the c5 pawn. So I think it's a good idea to analyze with engines in these types of positions because you get a better sense of really cool ideas that are available that you could apply at a later point. So some people were suggesting e6, and I think it is an interesting pawn sack if you follow it up with rook e1. Just attacking e6 and trying to open up the e-file, which is one of the biggest things that white can do for his attack. But I wasn't totally sure after knight f6, the pawn is defended. But now you also get the juicy e5 square. So definitely this would be an excellent way for white to play. Here there's a ridiculous tactic, knight dc4. And after the trade, the queen is trapped. Because if queen b4, then rook b1. Queen c3, rook b3 traps the queen. And if queen b5, there's a fork. And if queen c3, there's the quiet, well, rook c1, rook b1, and rook b3 traps the queen. So just an assortment of ridiculous ideas. Black actually has to go queen b5 here and then take on d6 with the knight, and black gets three pieces for the queen. But white should still be better because all of black's pieces are totally discombobulated, and the king's side is quite weak. So 
E6 was a very interesting alternative. Just sacking the pawn and opening up the center. An idea that you do see in a lot of different openings. In the perk, you see that often. In the perk in the modern, in the bishop c4 lines. There's a lot of lines here that... And I'm giving you just an abstraction where, like, you you know, you know drive the pawn up to east. I guess this is not a sacrifice, but it's the same type of idea. You're just blasting open the center. You're throwing the grenade in, and then you're picking it up later in many cases. Um, in any case, our opponent made a grave error with rook to g8. This just served us up with a very straightforward way to get the king into the open with all of our pieces participating. If king e8 here, then I would have taken. And now I like the look of a quiet move like rook a to c1, just bringing another piece into the attack, as I had discussed earlier. And now, for, for example, queen f7 is already winning because you have the additional check on c6. And takes, and now takes. That's the beauty of putting a rook on c1. You never know when it's going to serve you well. But it's never going to hurt to bring another piece into the attack. This was nominally more resilient. I think here the game is largely over. And our opponent did resign what I thought was a little bit prematurely, but the position is just disgusting. And as I had shown after bishop d7, I think the simplest is to go rook a c1, and then to play a move like knight to g6, or even without rook a c1, you could just go knight g6 straight away. And the game is over. The game is over because... Everything is hanging. Black has no ability to defend anything. This is just checkmate. I mean, just look at this position. Literally, we're attacking everything. We can go rook b1. We can go rook e1. There's many ways to win, but these types of moves, which just pick off a ton of material, are oftentimes the most clinical and the least risky. So you could dig around here on your own if you want a better kind of sense of why this is as lost as, as it is. But you should just understand that it's not even the, the threat of checkmate. White is not threatening checkmate here. It's just that the general nature of Black's pieces makes the position totally indefensible. Okay, so another successful fantasy outing. Very nice. We're building up quite a couple, quite a few nice games in the fantasy. Hope you enjoyed these. I'm also losing my voice. Hope you enjoyed these games. Hope you enjoyed the speedrun today, and hopefully see you tomorrow for Title Tuesday. Bye.